Welcome, my name is Carrie Gellrich. I'm a partner at North & Company Law Offices. We are a Southern Alberta law firm with offices throughout Southern Alberta, and we are proud to partner with the University of Lethbridge to offer a robust slate of play day activities. This is our third year supporting this event, and we're thrilled we found a way to keep this tradition going despite the restrictions we are all currently facing. This is an important community event and one we know families look forward to. The fact that Play Day encompasses a whole week this year and is available online means we can reach even more people. I hope you're enjoying the activities offered so far and will continue to take part over the next few days. We're proud to engage families across Southern Alberta in activities that support togetherness and community wellness. We know play is so important now more than ever for brain development and healthy communities and I'm excited to introduce Dr. Robin Gibb, who will speak more specifically on the importance of play. Okay, I'd like to start this evening by thanking the organizers of Play Week here at the University for inviting me to give you this lecture. Uh, play Week is an important week. Play Day at the University has been an important day, and it's been really hard not to be able to host that in a face-to-face -face sort of format this year. So I appreciate that they're trying hard to still communicate with the, uh, with the community through these presentations. So the presentation I have for you is entitled Building Resiliency Through Play. And I want to start with a quote that I got from the Peabody Essex Museum in Boston. Enough time has passed since the bad old days of believing that play was a waste of time. We now as neuroscientists understand the importance and value of play in building healthy brain development. And that information is some of what I'd like to share with you. First, I'd like to start with a little video. And this video is from the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative. It is a three minute video that discusses the importance of early experiences and how it shapes a developing brain to have positive outcomes later in life. Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. 
all those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. So in the video, we saw that experiences, positive experiences, can shape the brain in very positive ways. And the reason it works that way is it turns out that we now understand that our DNA that we inherit from our parents can be shaped by our experiences. And what that means is your experiences can turn on certain genes in your DNA and turn off others that are not coded for by that type of experience. So having lots of positive experiences during brain development can actually turn on genes that make a healthier brain. And this is the science of epigenetics. So what we see is that nature is our DNA and it can be controlled by nurture, which is the experiences that we have. And it turns out that those two things together make us the individuals who we eventually become. So this is the science of epigenetics, the ability of experience to leave a mark on our DNA and decide which genes are turned on and which are turned off. This is also known as the signature effect. So I think we should begin by defining play. And it turns out that play isn't about ultimate outcomes. It's really in the moment itself and it has no purpose outside of the play itself. It's bold. We do things when we're playing that we'd never consider doing in other situations in our lives, and it tends to occur spontaneously. It is driven by both curiosity and exploration, and when you're playing, it can create bliss or flow. So play is built on serve and return. We saw serve and return in the video, and it is one of the key features that build a healthy brain. It emerges in infancy and it promotes that nurturing relationship, which is the serve and return that a baby gets when mom is playing peekaboo with them, for instance. When baby laughs and smiles, mother is encouraged to continue with the play. So remember, the number one need for brain development in children is healthy, nurturing relationships. So we can examine the kinds of play. There are many, many types, and we're going to talk about five of them here. So the very first one I'd like to talk about is body play, which is motor and physical. It develops motor skills and strength and executive function. It helps you learn about your play partners and the rules that each of them have so you can keep that play about going for longer. The second type of play is social play, and it involves reciprocity, sharing, engaging in moral reasoning, understanding what the rules are going to be, and eventually cooperation. The third type of play is object play or constructive play. And this is the kind of play that Play Day usually offers here at the university when they bring in all kinds of boxes and cardboard so children can construct things from their imagination. It involves manipulating materials, ideas, and concepts and it involves control of the environment. The fourth kind of play is imaginative play or fantasy play. 
This type of play requires abstract reasoning, learning about language, sharing ideas, coming up with dreams or creative concepts, and it also involves understanding how other people feel about what you're doing. And the final type of play is games with rules. Life has rules and games have rules. And life has rules that have to be followed in order for a person to be successful. So games with rules is a way to help children understand that in order to be successful in the game, you have to follow the rules. Amongst all of these types of play, the development of emotional regulation is a common theme. So the very first type of play, big body play, it's physical, it's boisterous, it's vigorous. It involves wrestling and chasing, a desire to get away from gravity, jumping up high and feeling that air flowing through as you're coming down to earth. Uh, it often looks chaotic and it can cause parents a lot of concern at times and even educators when they're trying to encourage play in a classroom, but it is a great learning medium for all. So it provides possibilities for understanding social cues, cognitive understanding, emotional and physical benefits. All of these things come with big body play. We know that in Canada, there are movement guidelines for our children. And this is for zero to four years, but there's movement guidelines for all Canadians. And it is recommended that children under the age of four have three hours of that kind of um, fantasy or running and playing and jumping and uh, full body play three hours a day and it turns out that most of our children don't meet the guidelines so one of the problems is screen time and we do know that children are starting to view screens before age two about 90 percent of children do look at screens whether it be tv or an ipad or an iphone when we're talking about the iPad or the iPhone, about 40% of educational apps that are sold for those devices are actually aimed at children who are under the age of four. When we consider families, when we look in homes, almost 40% of those uh, families will recognize that they have television playing in the background just to sort of keep the, the family um, entertained maybe they're not even watching it but it's some kind of background noise and often it's on for many many hours in a day uh, these families 40 percent of families are reporting six hours or more where tv is playing we do know that the average preschooler is watching tv between two to five hours a day and we also know that more time spent in front of the screen causes more problems with obesity in children and type 2 diabetes. We have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes in North America now, where children are being diagnosed as young as three with type 2 diabetes. It used to be called adult onset diabetes, but they don't call it that anymore because so many children are experiencing it. The, one of the problems with this is they're eating more and they're moving less. So if you look at children across Canada, only between five to 12% of children are actually meeting the movement guidelines. And many of these children have problems with their sleep because they're simply not moving enough. There are guidelines that have been proposed by the Canadian P Pediatric Society, and this came out in 2017, and that is that children under two should try to avoid screen time. Between two and five years of age, the exposure should be limited to no more than one hour per day. And if a child is older than five, the exposure, exposure should be limited to no more than two hours per day. And a, re, a reminder that folks or families should not let their children look at screens within two hours of bedtime because of the possibility of disrupting circadian cycle. So we know that that movement, that exercise, has profound positive, uh, positive effects on the brain, and these are some of the effects that we see. It increases attention and cognitive control. It also increases proteins, and they, they keep that brain working better, keep it healthier, and the connection stronger. It also increases neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which is a learning area in our brain. And the cells that are, that are 
generated from movement and exercise help control an individual's stress levels. So it's associated with a greater sense of well-being and reduced stress. And finally, exercise increases blood vasculature to the brain. We bring in more oxygens and more nutrients to the cells in our brain and make them available to the brain cells so they can function better. The second type of play is social play. And there are many, many types of social play. It starts with what we call an occupied play. And this can be a child staring off into space, daydreaming and indulging in their own personal fantasies. We also have solitary play where a child will sit down and begin to play with things in their environment and make up, sometimes make up stories and, and a narrative associated with the play that they're engaging in. Onlooker play is when we have a child watching another child play and learning from that child who is playing. Parallel play is when we have a child who comes up to another child who is playing and they start doing the same thing without truly interacting with the first child. Then we have associative play where they start to talk to each other and they're actually sharing ideas and items in their play. And eventually we get to full cooperative play where children are understanding rules, they're doing this moral reasoning, they're deciding how the game is going to go and who's going to do what. The next kind of play is object play. Our human hand is evolved to manipulate objects and playing with objects leads us to learn about how things work. And this is when problem solving emerges. So it is a very important type of play. The next type is imaginative play. And this is where children get to express their full extent of what they know and what they think life is all about. They spin yarns, they share ideas in their imagination. Sometimes it's solo play, but sometimes it's with others. And they get involved in active storytelling, creating a narrative, improvising in all kinds of uh, interactive ways. And one of the things that emerges here is that there is a fundamental building up of the skills of communication, developing the story to share with others. And the last kind of play that I'd like to share with you are the games with rules. Now this is a picture of the Sorry game. And Sorry is a game, if you haven't played it, where it's kind of brutal. When you're playing, if you land on a square that another player is occupying, you knock off their man and put them back at the start. And so even if a person is doing very well in this game, if another person lands on their, their uh, marker, it goes back to home. And you can also sometimes choose who you're going to knock off the square and put back in home. Now, it seems like a bit of a brutal game, but it really develops emotional regulation in children. I love to play this game with my grandchildren, and I know they're finally getting there when I can play the game and there isn't tears involved. So it turns out that who we play with make a difference. Playing with mom looks different than playing with dad. Moms tend to keep things simple and on the table, things that they can tidy up relatively easily. It could be coloring or playing a board game or perhaps reading with the children. Dads, on the other hand, really like the rough and tumble play. Let's get at it. It's more big body play as we've just described it. But siblings and friends can engage in all types of play. So it turns out that who you're playing with and how many different people you're playing with has an impact on your brain development. And I'd like to acknowledge the work from Sergio Pallas, who is in the Department of Neuroscience here at the University of Lethbridge. Sergio has been studying play for a very long time. He was, he's been at it for his entire career here in Lethbridge, so more than 30 years. He's been studying play when play wasn't cool, and most people were wondering why on earth he would waste his time studying something that was a waste of time. But his studies have shown us how critical play is for developing the brain in positive ways and supporting behavior in an individual later in life. So he's taught us that who you're playing with does make a difference, and how much you play makes a difference as well. Sergio and his wife Vivian has, have written this lovely book called The Playful Brain. The next uh, 
scientist I'd like to introduce you to who's interested in play is Dr. Stuart Brown. Now, Dr. Brown is actually a psychiatrist who has been studying years and years of people who engage in horrific criminal behavior. And what he has learned from his studies is that if you don't have play as a child, you develop with a lack of empathy and a lack of other skills that help you do better in society. Why is play important? Well, begin to think of life without it. No humor, no innovation, diminished creativity, depression, physical inactivity, and then think about life with it. Humor, optimism, physical activity, deep engagement, and it is the key to unlocking one's own innate personal talents. It is also the key to really look, looking within oneself for what is it that really motivates me, what makes me a self, what gives me a sense of purpose, what gives me a sense of, of future. And without play, we don't really have that deep engagement in life and our, our own future and our own authentic self. So we know that there are six benefits that come from play. Play builds imagination and creativity. It fosters cognitive growth and it reaps emotional and behavioral benefits. We do know that play facilitates group or social interaction and it also encourages greater independence when a child is motivated to play and finally gets off their mom or dad's knee. It also promotes physical fitness when they get into that big body, rough and tumble play where there's lots of motion involved. So the cognitive benefits of play are very diverse and they're plentiful. We know from studies that have examined the brain that play helps people focus and it also increases brain size, structure and function. It builds thinking and language skills. It improves motor skills, both fine motor and gross motor skills. And it enhances brain connectivity in key areas that are supporting our ability to communicate with others and develop our language skills. These skills all contribute to better executive function. So play improves executive function. Engaging in play promotes our ability to self-regulate, to regulate our emotions, and to manage how we interact with people and how we feel about those interactions. It increases connections in the frontal lobe, which is an area that supports executive functions. And the executive functions that we're referring to can be broadly defined as working memory, your ability to hold instruction in mind and to manipulate that instruction and to compare your own action against the instruction until it is completed. Cognitive flexibility is another important executive function and it allows us to think about problem solving in more than one way. How can you sort this bin of toys? Can you sort it according to what is fluffy or what has wheels, if they're all red, if they're all blue? These kinds of things actually help a child figure out that problem solving can be approached from multiple angles. And behavioral inhibition is the last important executive function that we'll talk about. And this is where self-regulation comes into play. You're actually inhibiting behaviors that are inappropriate in given situations. And in doing so, you are acting more successfully in those situations. It turns out that there are two key periods during life when executive function skills are able to be laid down in the brain and they're greatly enhanced. So the first period of time is between the ages of about two to five years of age. So in the preschool period, and the second time when we can build our executive function skills is between the ages of about 12 to about 25 years of age. So we can continue to improve our executive function skills well into adulthood. And we now know that no matter how old you are, you can always work at building executive function. So as I've already mentioned, executive function is supported by the frontal cortex, in particular the prefrontal cortex. And we now know that it's more important for school readiness than even IQ. It predicts math and reading competency throughout the school years. And we know that adults 
who, when tested as children, had inadequate executive function skills, when they grow up, they have worse mental and physical health outcomes, they earn less money, and they commit more crimes. So even small improvements in executive function translate to huge improvements for society in health, wealth, and a lower crime rate. This was discussed in a paper by Terry Moffat and his colleagues that was published in 2011. Now, Terry Moffat is what we call a neuroeconomist, and he based his, his paper on understanding that if people built better executive function skills, had improved academic success, and improved life success, our societies will benefit as a result. So I want to share with you a program that we're doing in Lethbridge and have been doing for the past five years. It's called the Building Brains and Future Project. And we have, over the past five years, tested more than 100 children and their families. In September, we take a baseline of how children are doing on a variety of tests, both motor and cognitive tests, executive function tests, and language. And then we engage the children in this play program. The educators at the schools where the children are attending or the preschool, uh, the preschool settings in either the school system or in childcare are given the instruction on how to play the games and how to interact with the children. And then they're left to it for approximately seven months. Then we come back and we test the children again at the end of the school year. So the child enrichment play was taking place in either the, the schools or in the daycare setting. And, and we also offered a parent enrichment program called the Connection Cafe. And at these programs, we invited parents to come in and ask questions that were important to them regarding child development. And we brought in various speakers from Alberta Mental Health, from Alberta Health Services, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, people from the family center who could comment on bedtime routine and fussy eating, all kinds of people who parents felt they could learn from. Then we did post-enrichment testing of the children in June. So our enrichment program consisted of a number of games that we went into the primary literature and found games that were reported to build executive function in children. You'll recognize many of these games as games that you played as a child, but you probably didn't know you were building your executive function skills while you were playing these games. Red light, green light is one of them. Simon Says is another. An opposites game where a child is shown a picture of a moon and they have to report day or they're shown a picture of an unhappy face and they have to say happy. We also play musical freeze, which is a version of musical chairs. In this case, the music, when it stops, you have to assume a particular pose and everybody assumes the pose. Last child to make the pose is out. And yes, we have children lose these games. Now, when we first started working with early child educators, they didn't want any of their children to lose. But we told them that children have to learn as young people how to lose and how to regulate their emotion around that loss. Because when they get older, if they haven't had that experience, they will be unable to accept loss in their lives. So we worked at it, and at first the educators were really afraid of it, but after we tried it with them, they started embracing the notion that they were worried they'd be wiping a lot of tears and giving lots of hugs, but they said it was the other children who supported children who were having a hard time with their loss. The next game is pretend play, so this is imaginative play. We usually offer uh, little uniforms or, or dress ups where a child can put on a, a firefighter's uniform, for instance, and then the other child might be someone who's having a fire. We would have one person dressed as a policeman and the other is somebody who the policeman is interacting with. We could have a shopper and a cashier in a shopping setting, those kinds of things. The children play for a few minutes and then they switch roles and they assume the role of the other person in that play dyad. We also encourage the use of lips and ears, and lips and ears really help children learn how to communicate. So when the child is handed a set of lips, they're encouraged to speak. If they're given an ear, they're encouraged to listen.
This is a really useful technique in classrooms when, when teachers want children to listen to what they have to say or when they're encouraging children to take turns as they speak. The next game is a shared project game and this is where children are given a lot of materials and then they have to decide with a, a peer what they're gonna build, how they're gonna build it, and eventually who will take it home. So there's a lot of negotiation that happens with the shared project. The next game is called Wait For It, and this is when the child is given something very appealing, is put in front of them, and they are told if they wait until the teacher or the uh, child care provider says they can have it, if they wait that long, they will get a second of whatever it is that they've been uh, introduced to. So it could be something that's really yummy, a treat, or it could be something like slime in one color and you'll get another little vial of slime if you wait until I tell you to open it to play with it. The next game is called the dimensional change card sort game which is a long way of saying we have a deck of cards and in the cards are various shapes. There could be bunnies and there can be boats for instance. So the bunnies are one way of sorting the deck and boats are another way sorting according to shape. But these bunnies can be red or blue, and so can the boats. So a child could sort according to color. They could have all of the red things in one pile and all of the blue things in another pile. So they've changed the sorting on a different dimension. And that is precisely how we build flexible thinking in children. So you can add more items to the game. You can have more shapes. You can have more colors. And you can even have numbers of things on those cards. And then children have all kinds of possibilities to sort the deck in a variety of different ways. And the last game is Right is Right. And this is a Lego block building game. And it is a game that, uh, that Claudia Gonzalez came up with in her lab. And it really involves children given a model, a Lego model, and they're encouraged to build the Lego model. Well, we film these children as they're picking up bricks. And what we learn from this work is that children who pick up bricks with their right hand and stabilize the model with their left hand tend to have better executive function, no matter whether they were reported to be left-handed or right-handed. So that is, uh, that is one thing that Claudia and I are still looking at. So I want to show you what we found out from our very first attempt. We had two classrooms, two, two teachers were taught all of the games and how to interact. One teacher really embraced it. It became part of her everyday life in her classroom. She played the games every day and in every way she could think of. And the other teacher thought, well, it's interesting, but I already have a really good program. So she really didn't play the games outside of the Lego. So at the end of the school year, when we came in to test the children, we had the teachers fill out a survey. How much did you use the games? And what did you do with them? So the one teacher reported she used them all the time and the other teacher reported she used them very little. What we discovered is in the classroom where the children got a high dose of the games, they showed improvements in motor skills, executive function skills, and language skills all the way across the board. In the other classroom, children only showed improvements in motor skills. Interesting to note is the children that got the high dose actually started at a lower level than the children who got the low dose. But those children ended up with much higher executive function scores than the children in the other classroom. So we were motivated then to continue on with this program. We started adding more sites. We had Opacos and Early Intervention Society join us in this work. And we also did some work with Sunny South Daycare. So we did all kinds of motor and cognitive tests that were different than the games that children were playing. It's important to understand that the testing was actually done in a game format. And the motor test showed that their Lego building accuracy went up, picking up fruit loops of different colors. That was also more accurate. Block building was more accurate. Grass and snow is a game of opposites. So when children are, are told the word snow, they're encouraged to touch the green paper. And they're, when they hear the word grass, they're encouraged to touch the white paper. That went up significantly in these children as well. And the time to build the models went down significantly. 
Children were also given the ages and stages questionnaire, which is a typical questionnaire used for development, and it is used in all kinds of healthcare settings. And they were tested against themselves. Now, the beautiful thing of the ages and stages questionnaire is it takes into account that the child is natu naturally aging. And so the second test point, they should do better than they did at the first. And because of, we understood this to be the case, we tested each child against themselves and age was taken into account. So when we see a significant improvement, it means that the curriculum was likely involved in creating this improvement for the children. We saw better communication skills, better problem solving skills, better personal and social skills in the children. And they also had better social emotional behavior. Now you'll notice that the social emotional behavior goes down in the post-test in that group and that is the right direction. That means that children are doing better with their social emotional behavior. After we did this, we decided we needed to get out into the community and talk to more families and parents and we changed our name to Building Brains Together. Our vision is building healthy, resilient children, families, and society, and our mission is to build adult capabilities to improve brain development and executive functions in children through both research and education. Our goals are for continuous evidence-based learning, those resilient children, and empowered adults who have an authentic engagement and support child brain development. So I want to show you a video made here by, at the university about the work that we're doing in the community. I think I'm ready to say good morning. Good morning. A few years back, the Alberta government invested in testing children to find out how prepared they were for kindergarten. Then we learned that Lethbridge's children were behind the rest of the children in Alberta. Having a post-secondary institution like the University of Lethbridge in the city, I felt we had an obligation to try to make a difference for the children in the community. My name is Robin Gibb and I'm an Associate Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge. My name is Lynn Wytrickish and I'm the Early Education Program Manager at Westminster Elementary School. I'm working alongside Dr. Gibb on a research project that really is looking at how to enhance executive function skills with children in their early years. One of the key areas that I'm interested in is the prefrontal cortex. It's the frontmost part of the brain and it's the part of the brain that supports what we call executive function. These these functions are what helps us become successful in life and they include things like working memory, flexible thinking and behavioral inhibition. What that looks like in our classroom is an executive function skill building curriculum that was given to us by Dr. Gibb. That really involves 10 games that we're playing daily and we've really taken it to just using those games but also finding ways to embed the same message that those games are portraying within all of the activities that we do so that the children really are spending every day getting quality practice with those skills. I believe that with positive and intentional experiences you can make a difference in a child's brain development and their academic performance. We have the opportunity to get right into the core of what's happening in our society and try to have an impact based on what we've learned from the research that we do in the labs. Just wanting every child to be successful. I mean, that's really the root of all of it. Good morning, Finnegan. Good morning, Chrisica. Where have you been today? Now this Peyton. So one thing we do know about play is it reduces stress. When people are engaged in play, children are engaged in play, it reduces their cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone. It increases their expression of anandamide, which is an endocannabinoid that is very much like THC and marijuana. We can make that naturally and we do make it when we play. It also increases our ability to express naturally made morphine-like molecules in our brain, and these are called endorphins. And as a result of all of this, it increases our sense of pleasure. We know that children who have had a lot of stress early in their lives tend to react in situations with the autonomic nervous system. They can en engage in a fight or flight response, or they can engage in a rest and digest response, but it's usually fight or flight when they feel threatened in environment. And as a result of that, 
they tend to react quickly in a situation rather than engaging their thinking brain, their executive function skills into helping understand what's happening in that situation and how they should behave. When a child has been faced with a lot of adversity early in life, they have an overactive autonomic nervous system geared for the fight and flight response. And that remains true when they enter adulthood because they haven't had enough of those positive experience early in life. They tend to react quickly and can react in a way that is more, less cognitive and more unconscious in a situation. So this is something that we know we can help with when we have children playing. So what we hope for eventually is a balance between that automatic self-regulation, the fight or flight response, and the intentional self-regulation, how you're going to react based on the knowledge you've gained on what that situation means to you. Attention turns out to be the critical gatekeeper that is necessary to engage that intentional self-regulation. The skills that you will engage in are inhibitory control, working memory, and mental flexibility. So those are the essential capabilities that help us overcome our automatic response to, uh, to situations that feel like they're threatening. So overall, we want to build supportive, positive relationships which help reduce sources of stress, and that builds those core life skills, including executive function skills in people. For children, it means healthy development and better educational achievement. And for adults, it means responsive caregiving and economic stability in the family. So we know that play improves relationships. It fosters caring and compassion and it helps develop empathy and trust between individuals. Remember, nurturing relationships build brain. I have for you here on this slide a picture of Dr. Hans Selye, and he was a Canadian researcher who in the 1950s started studying the effects of stress. And he made this quote, every stress leaves an indelible scar and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. Now he made this claim way back in the 1960s, but we now know how it works. Because of epigenetics, our experiences are written on top of our DNA. So the memory of those experiences are stored in our body. Here's a picture of a chromosome again. And on the end of this chromosome shown in green, we see these pink areas. The pink areas are called telomeres, and the length of the telomeres actually define how many times the cell can divide before it dies. So the telomeres are really important, and they naturally shorten as we age. It turns out that if a person has experienced toxic stress, and this can be a child or an adult, it accelerates the shortening process of those telomeres. But there's some good news here. You can build healthy, nurturing relationships, and that will reverse the shortening effect on the telomeres and add length to the telomeres. And if you're interested in how this works, I would encourage you to see a talk by Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. It's a TED talk that's available on YouTube. And she talks about building those telomeres with healthy relationships. So when we think about resilience, resilience requires relationship, not self-determination, not your ability to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and succeed. And these capabilities that underlie resilience can be strengthened at any age. We also know that individuals who are resilient in one situation of adversity may sh not show resilience in another situation or another response to adversity. So resilience is definitely a state. It is not a trait. So I wanted to show you this little resiliency scale. And this is a balance, a scale that has a fulcrum. If the fulcrum shifts at the bottom, it can shift the way we respond to experiences. Now, if we consider our positive experiences piling up on one side, it can lead to positive outcomes when the fulcrum is right in the middle of the balance. 
negative experiences can shift the scale to tip in the negative direction when the fulcrum is right in the middle of the balance. But what we're experiencing right now with the pandemic is the fulcrum is shifting off to the left and it's making us less resilient. And so our negative experiences have even a bigger effect on our brain and on our behavior. And as a result of that, it requires more work, more positive experiences to build that resilience. And resilience, I want to remind you, is the ability to overcome hardship. So resiliency, we know, is promoted by the release of oxytocin, which is considered a bonding hormone. It increases in the presence of an attached adult for a child. So in the presence of a parent who is strongly attached to the child, oxytocin is released in the child and in the parent. When oxytocin is released, it reduces the stress response and it also increases brain plasticity. So again, I want to remind you that humans thrive on relationship. Now, Dr. Gordon Neufeld is a psychologist in Vancouver who's been studying human relationship for a long time. He used to work with youth who were in the criminal justice system. And he came up with attachment rituals that any of us can use with anybody. So if you look at a person and you look at their face and you smile in a friendly way, you collect their eyes, you wait until they're looking at you, and then you smile, give them a little nod, you're assuring them that you are very happy in their presence. And that is the way we can fundamentally start to build relationship with others. If you give a little touch of proximity, a slight touch on the arm uh, that says, hey, you know, I recognize you're here and I'm glad you're here. And when you speak with warmth, it gives the child or another person the sign that they are significant and that you care about them. We underestimate the benefit of smiling. Smiling can result in another person smiling. Again, if you collect their eyes and then smile at them, you tend to get a smile back in return. Dr. Ron Gutman has studied smiling for years and he has shown us that it reduces blood pressure, it increases those natural endorphins that we're able to make, and it reduces our stress hormones at the same time. Laughter is another key way that we can get our brain in the perfect place for learning and understanding life. So when we engage in laughter, it is very much akin to what, we, what happens in our brain when we are doing mindfulness or meditation. It puts our brain in a particular mode of being that actually increases its ability to understand and it also promotes relationship. So we know that play can develop executive function it can also restore circuitry in children that has failed to develop as a result of prenatal stress or a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or even other developmental disorders like autism. Play can enhance a person's self-esteem. If you have little people coming over and wanting to play with you, it can make you feel really good about yourself. And it also helps create a strong sense of who you are and how you fit into the greater world around you. It improves our memory. But play doesn't just benefit children, it also benefits adults. So for adults, it promotes a joyful life. It helps stimulate learning. It increases our motivation and our creativity, and it relieves our stress. It helps make you feel that you're young and full of life. When we play, we are at our happiest and we can withstand incredible hardships. When we play, we are engaging in complex interactions with each other and we are building our brains. And when we play, those social interactions become relationships and we need play to connect all three of those together. 
different types of play actually contribute to different aspects of the three core principles of development. But as a whole, they actually prepare me better as a child to respond to uncertainty and to the unknown in my environment. Play supports responsive relationships between caregivers and children by inviting an interaction that is already natural for both the parent or the caregiver and the child. The child naturally wants to engage with the parent around an object or around an expression or around a story. And likewise, parents or caregivers want to respond to that invitation from the child. At Nebraska Children's Home Society, one of the things that we do a lot of is play. And so what we want to do within those programs is promote the, the opportunity for in, um, family members to play with their children to see how they can build that relationship. Families are struggling with scarcity issues and they're very busy. And so for them to just take a m minute and see how it's helping their child. When they're playing with an object and coming up to them and sitting down for just five minutes and interacting with them and asking them open-ended questions about what they're doing. If you can cue them into that and then also model that for them in the home environment, they're much more likely to do it themselves once we leave. We've put these installations in at the bus stops and really the idea is you're waiting for the bus and could we provide a way for folks to begin to interact. One student who was waiting, and he, he comes from a long line of drummers in his family, and he um, the installation was a musical installation. So he came and banged out this awesome beat, um, and that filled the whole area. It caused parents to like stop looking at their phones and walk over and be like, okay, so this is maybe how I would play it. Do you want to play with me? And so you got this kind of multi-generational interaction happening through this one intervention at this one bus stop. Play engages core life skills by requiring children to actually plan their interactions around play. When you are trying to build a tower, for example, you actually have a plan of what you want it to look like. And so you are thinking and using your planning skills and also problem solving skills if that tower topples over. Or when you're playing a game, you're having to follow rules and sometimes be flexible because your friend wants to change those rules. So in the Children's Museum environment, there are a variety of ways in which these institutions design and offer activities to support core life skills, particularly around executive function. So we see many uh, construction activities that require multiple children to coordinate and collaborate to build a structure as part of a design challenge. And that requires children to do some pretty complex negotiation in what is often a completely new social group. Instead of telling people they need to play, we just need to create that environment which is conducive to it and supports it. Jumping Feet, which is what this installation was called in Urban Thinkscape, is actually one of the best examples of how we translated the science of playful learning to design. Um, so what we used were patterns that were used as exercises to um, support self-control in children. The way we transferred that, and it's a very direct translation to design, is a hopscotch which creates a certain pattern of left foot, right foot, left foot, um, and then you break that. Um, that's the way for, for the environment to help us learn self-control. The situation in slums in Brazil is that you don't have a public space that is safe, so the kid cannot go outside and play by themselves or enjoy the nature because they don't have the space. So imagine a kid confined in a house with an adult doesn't know how to stimulate that kid. If the adult was more prepared to provide a resources or situation in which the kid could play under their guidance, the kid could learn how to self-control because I'm here trying to do something, having a, a spoon and trying to use it with my pens or things like that. So by playing, kids are exploring and understanding the world around them. And in, in this process of experiencing, testing, understanding, they are learning social skills, motor skills, emotional and, and cognitive skills.
what we know is that by engaging in play, your stress levels are reduced, you are practicing the core life skills that actually allow you to assess a situation and know how to change it so that you are not feeling under attack or stressed. We also know that it allows you to practice different coping skills. And importantly, it also reduces the stress of a parent or a caregiver. Play can be a doorway to bringing the children who are traumatized um, into having that sense of security. An example is this one child who lost, who had lost the mom. And she was the only breadwinner. She was a single mom. This child did not know anywhere else that she could go to. And the only place that she went to was to the caregiver. She took a doll and the caregiver just came and sat down with her and asked her, why did you pick that particular doll? And her response was, because mommy loved this doll. They sat down and they had a discussion uh, through uh, after that with involving the doll. Play won't fix everything, but we definitely embrace play as, again, a therapeutic uh, intervention to support not just survival, but thriving through incredibly stressful uh, experiences and environments. There's been a ton of work done by the Louisiana Children's Museum in the wake of Hurricane Katrina on how to take play, among other methodologies, child-centered methodologies, to really help children heal, how to process their experiences and express them in ways, again, that are therapeutic and that are developmentally appropriate. We know about the research that tells us that play makes us feel better. <laughs> it is a strategy for resilience. So our Building Brains Together program is based on building adult capability. We share learning about brain development. We share concrete examples on how to build brains in positive ways. We work with active skill building in the adults that we are, that are participating in our studies. And we support families and their children as a community. And the number one way to build that wonderful development in a child's brain and positive relationship with an adult is through play. George Bernard Shaw famously said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>